acids and bases, and it's the longest chapter. Uh, so I'm going to go through these slides kind of expeditiously to try to get through in reasonable amount of time. It's still going to be longer than the usual chapters. So I'm going to go through the credits kind of quickly. Uh, mainly that's just going to be Brown and LeMay's chemistry and Zumdahl's chemistry. So uh, I'm not trying to rush through this and leave you behind. This is important material, and you'll want to be sure that you get it because we'll build on it for the rest of the class, basically. But uh, at the same time, there are so many slides, like even after I went through and culled out about 30 or 40 slides, there are still like 130 slides that we need to go through. A lot of them I'm going to just kind of skim through, but nevertheless, we have a lot. So let's go ahead and get going on this. So I'm going to go on uh, and click next, 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 uh, the, and just to say that the commentary is provided by myself. Here are the big deals for this chapter, uh, acid-base dissociation constants. You don't really understand what a lot of this is right now. So rather than to read this whole list, I'm going to just go ahead and go on, and we'll see them as we get to them. So uh, first of all, uh, acids and bases originally were defined by a guy named Arrhenius. Uh, he said that acids produce H plus and bases produce OH minus. Uh, uh, later on, they decided to refi refine that and say that, uh, and, and if you think about it for a moment, and I, I don't have time to discuss this, but H plus is just the same thing as a hydrogen without its electron, which means it's actually just a proton, right? So Bronsted Lowry came along le later on and said that acids are proton donors and bases are proton acceptors. And then, uh, so uh, that's two different theories of acid base. And this is the one here that we're actually gonna use uh, and then at the very end of this chapter, we'll talk a little bit about the Lewis concept. Uh, so that is on this slide uh, where you're talking not in terms of the protons, but in terms of the electrons, uh, which is a more general way to discuss acids and bases. So things like boron, for example, can be basic, uh, sorry, acidic in the Lewis sense. Don't worry about that right now. Uh, so the most uh, important part of this chapter is going to be doing like pH determinations. And so the, the, it isn't just a question of, well, this is how you do pH. There are different problems and different types of things that we encounter. So let's go to the next slide. So the basic setup we're going to have for the whole chapter and then also the next few chapters is that we'll have an acid. And here they're showing whatever the other part of the acid is besides that thing right there. And that thing right there is H+. So for example, if this were hydrochloric acid, then this would be the Cl- minus part. And then this thing right here in the kind of like middle, left middle, is water. So that's just H2O. And what happens is that we're going to assume that this hydrogen plus goes on to this water and makes an H3O plus. Now, they used to write it as H plus. So you'd have the water and then you'd have this H plus floating around. But uh, what actually happens in real life is that that H plus will basically associate itself with the water. And so you'll end up with something like that, which is H3O plus, and that's called hydronium ion. <clears throat> and then you'll wind up over here with your Cl minus or your Br minus or whatever. I mean, it, it could be something much larger than that, like CH3COO minus, but that's called your conjugate base. So just, uh, in other words, you start off with an acid that's a complete acid like HA or like HCl, H2SO4 or whatever. And then when it donates its proton, Everything that's left over is called its conjugate base. Okay, and then uh, for your base, which in this case is water, and we're going to see that water can act as an acid or a base, then when it accepts a proton and acts as a base, it's whatever it becomes is called the conjugate acid of that base. Next slide. So again, I, I apologize, but I'm going to be going a little faster than usual. So we have to distinguish between strong acids and weak acids, and that's one of the key points of this chapter. So we have to do problems that involve strong acids differently than we do weak acids. And so uh, we have to know which acids are strong and which are weak, and it turns out that the easiest way to do that is just to memorize the ones that are strong. And there are seven of those, and we'll also have to do the same thing for bases later. Uh, so there are seven strong acids. You'll just have to memorize those, and it won't be on your formula sheet. So in order to do a problem, you'll first have to identify whether this is strong or weak acid. For a strong acid, we're going to consider that the uh, thing completely dissociates. So it says here the ionization equilibrium lies far to the right, which I just drew right through that. But anyway, 
so, uh, and then it also has another statement that we need to remember. When you have a strong acid, the conjugate base that it produces after it reacts will be weak. So just think of it like what it, whatever it is, it will produce the opposite. If it's a weak acid, which we'll talk about later, it will produce a strong conjugate base and vice versa. And so, and that's also written down here. For a weak acid, we're going to consider that the equilibrium lies far to the left. And that would be an example like acetic acid, which is the main ingredient in vinegar. Uh, so that barely dissociates. So most of it will stay as CH3COOH, and only a little bit of it will actually dissociate. So uh, we consider that equilibrium to lie far to the left. Next slide. Here it is in picture form. So on the left, we have the strong acid where <clears throat> we start off with a concentration of HA and we end up after it dissociates with a concentration of H plus. That's just about the same as the original concentration of the HA. So we just assume they're the same. So that's why we have to know whether it's a strong acid or a weak acid. Because if it's a strong acid, we're just going to assume that it completely dissociates. Uh, so let me just list them for you right now. Some of them you already know. So hydrochloric HCl, hydrobromic, <coughs> hydroiotic, and then um, let's see, nitric acid HNO3, uh, sulfuric acid H2SO4, and then the two you may not know would be chloric and perchloric. That's HClO3 and HClO4. So you'll want to just remember those. And then if it isn't one of those seven, you just assume that it's going to be a weak acid. And it's going to behave in this way, where you start off with a certain concentration of your acid, but you're not producing that amount of H+. You're just producing that little tiny amount of H+. So we have to do problems with weak acids differently. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, we talked before about this constant equilibrium constant, which we called K. Uh, it's sometimes written K with a subscript EQ for equilibrium. And then we said that we were going to start off by saying that we have a KC for concentration and a KP for pressure. Now, in this chapter, we're going to come up with a couple of more, uh, actually three more. KA, which we see here, uh, which is an equilibrium constant where you're dealing with a specific kind of an acid-base reaction where you're reacting a weak acid with water. And it has to be exactly that way. And we'll see many examples of that. But you'll want to be sure that you remember that for the test because you may have to write it out. <clears throat> then there's also a KB expression uh, where you have uh, the same thing as what we're going to talk about for acids. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And it's a little different and it may be a little confusing. So I think we're going to introduce that in just a moment. But we'll delay talking about base reactions until later. And then there's also Kw, which is the constant for water. In other words, it's the auto dissociation of water, where water will break up just a little bit into H plus or H3O plus and OH minus. Uh, and so that's called K sub W. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so here we have an HA expression and uh, KA expression. And notice that uh, it has this particular form, and it has to be exactly the way it's written here. It has to be a weak acid, and then it has to be water. It has to be water right there. Even if it's something like OH-, minus, it's not a Ka expression. So in other words, in order to do problems like we're going to do in a minute, uh, we have to have an equilibrium constant. We have to have a certain kind of an expression. So products of a reactants here would be H3O times HA over H. Uh, times A minus, sorry, over HA times H2O. And let me say it again because I kind of messed it up. So it's going to be the concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of A minus over the concentration of HA times the concentration of H2O. But since this one is a pure liquid, we just call the concentration one and kind of like leave it out. So you don't see that over here. It's just an empty space. So it's just H3O plus concentration times A minus concentration over the HA. So that is, by definition, what we're going to call Ka. And again, remember, it has to be exactly this way. Next slide. Uh, for Kb, we're going to introduce it now, but we're not going to really do any problems with it right now. We'll wait till later. I mean, we'll, we'll do some simple problems, but not actual, like, the longer problems. So this is when you have a base reaction, like, for example, with NH3. NH3 is ammonia, and that is a weak base. And so when you have a Kb expression, again, 
it has to be in exactly this form. So you have to remember that because you'll get confused otherwise on the tests. It has to be added to H2O. That's really the key. So you have to have, first of all, a wheat base plus water. So Ka is specifically when you have a weak acid plus water, and Kb is specifically when you have a weak base plus water. So for a base like NH3, you would add um, H plus coming off of the water. So this one's going in the other direction, which is why I, I try to avoid talking about it too much at the beginning of this chapter because it can be confusing. But what happens is that water can act either as an acid or a base. And here it's actually acting as the acid, whereas in the previous example, it was acting as the base, right? So we call something like that amphoteric. Uh, here, it's actually donating a proton to the NH3, so the NH3 is actually more basic than the water. So when it does that, it produces NH4+, and leaves the water with a form of OH-. So you just have to remember that. It won't produce H3O+, here. The equilibrium expression would be this concentration times this concentration, over this concentration, where again, we're going to just leave out the water. Next slide. So for strong acids, the main thing you need to remember is that the Ka will be uh, very large. If one of the, well, let me come back to that. And for a weak acid, Ka will be small. Now, in fact, we don't even really talk about Ka values for strong acids because, for example, for HCl, it's basically infinite. And so usually we just assume that it's completely dissociated, which means we don't even really worry about Ka's for strong acids. Uh, you could do the calculation. There's one of the strong acids that we mentioned, the chloric one, the HClO3. Uh, the K, the, you actually can do a Ka for that one. Uh, so in that case, you would have the HClO3 plus water. So you would do it like you do the weak acids, and you would get about one for your K value there. The other ones are very large. Uh, so because the HClO3 one is not as large as the other ones. Some books don't consider it to be a strong acid, but we're going to consider it to be a strong acid, and we're going to consider it that it will completely dissociate. Uh, and then I'll let you pause this video if you want to and read the rest of this on your own, but we've already talked about this. Uh, one of the key points here, actually, let's spend just a few more seconds. Uh, we're going to assume for a strong acid that whatever the concentration of the original acid was, that it's going to be the same as the H3O plus concentration. For a weak acid, we're not going to do that. So that means that uh, we're going to basically assume for weak acids that the acid basically stays in the form of the weak acid, like CH3COOH, and it will stay that way. So you're, for example, if you put it in water, you're going to have just two, those two things. You're going to have the CH3COOH in water. Uh, also, we want to compare the base that's produced when these things donate their protons uh, and compare it with water. So if we put water in the middle, let me just write an H for H2O. If we put that in the middle, then we're going to have that that is actually going to be less basic than the A from a weak acid. So in other words, the A minus from a weak acid will be stronger as a base than water. But water will be a stronger base than the conjugate uh, base from a strong acid. And that goes back to what we said before. A strong acid will have a weak conjugate base. Uh, so this one is from a strong acid and the other one is from a weak acid. And they're not going to be the same structure. They're both written as A minus, but they're not going to be the same. So an A minus from a weak acid would be something like CH3COO minus whereas from a strong acid, it would be something like Cl minus. So the Cl minus will be less basic than water. It'll be a very weak base, uh, whereas the CH3COO minus will actually be stronger as far as its base properties than water. Next slide. So water, as we said, is amphoteric. It can be either an acid or a base. And then also, as we've already mentioned, when you just have pure water, it auto dissociates to a very small extent. So it, a little bit of the water will always break up into H plus or H3O plus and OH minus. And when you multiply those two concentrations, you get this number right here and you'll want to remember this number. So it's one times 10 to the minus 14th. So whenever you have pure water and what we mean by that is like deionized water, 
then the concentration of the H plus times the concentration of the OH minus always equals 1 times 10 to the minus 14th. Uh, we're going to do a derivative of this, a derivation of this later, which I'll probably go through very quickly, where we're going to like convert these to the pH and pOH scale. Uh, so I'll just tell you right now that we're also going to learn that the pH, which you don't know what it is yet and don't worry about it, plus the pOH will equal 14. And that, when we get to that, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Now that actually comes from this expression. So what we want to remember right now is that the concentration of H plus, or H, actually H3O plus, times the concentration of OH minus gives 1 times 10 to the minus 14th. And this is called KW. So this is uh, like another K. Uh, and this is always going on. So this, whenever you have anything happening in water, you've also got this happening. So you always have to stop and wonder if this is going to be your dominant equilibrium. Uh, and again, we'll get back to that. Next slide. So here, what is the equilibrium constant expression for this? And they're going to uh, tell us that we're writing this uh, as H3O plus rather than H plus on the next slide. But the, the equilibrium expression is just going to be what we just said. We've already done it. So for the sake of time, it's going to be that concentration times that concentration over this concentration and leave this right here out. So just leave that out. Next slide. And then we're going to go on also to the next slide. And uh, here it is at the bottom. So, and we've already done this before, right? So we don't need to spend any time on it, except let me just put an A there to show that this is a KA. And uh, so it's H3O plus concentration and so forth. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so concept check. If the equilibrium less to the right, the value for K is going to be larger, more than one. If the equilibrium lies to the left, the value for k is going to be smaller, less than 1. Next slide. Now it's not working. <clears throat> and I always have to be careful here because if it's not working and I keep clicking it, sometimes it'll just click like two or three slides in a row and then I'll get stuck. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, finally. I had to click it like five times to get it to do that. All right. Uh, so here's another concept check. If water is a better base than A minus, and let me just point out what they're asking here. If this is a better base than this, then which way is this equilibrium going to lie? Okay, so the way that they're phrasing this, and I know why they're doing it, they're trying to get you to look at this in terms of the whether the water is a better base. Uh, and <clears throat> the answer is that if you have a strong acid, its, its conjugate base will be a worse base than water. Uh, if you have a weak acid, then its conjugate base will be a stronger base than water is. In this case, what's going to happen is you're going to have this equilibrium going to the right. So uh, that means that this HA is going to be a strong acid here. And the value for Ka is going to be greater than 1. But the way that they ask the question, it's kind of hard to understand what they're saying. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Next. Next. So let's go ahead and move on to bigger and better things here. Next slide. Uh, and you'll start to understand what they're trying to get at here. But that last problem wasn't the best way to ask it. <clears throat> so let's look at this one. Consider a one molar solution of HCl. Now this is one of the seven strong acids. And that's the first thing that you have to recognize on these problems. Order the following from strongest to weakest base. Um, actually, and then this, even this doesn't make sense, but it's okay. Uh, from strongest to weakest base, the strongest base is going to be the conjugate base of the weak acid here. So this is going to be number one. Water is going to be in the middle, and then the weakest base here is going to be the conjugate base of your strong acid, which is going to be Cl minus. Okay, and uh, so you maybe just want to memorize that. Uh, if you don't quite get it, because what's going to happen is you will get it eventually. Next slide. So next. Next. Uh, next. Okay. All right. Now consider a different situation. We have a solution of NaA. Uh, all right. So this is actually a salt. That, so say maybe something like NaCl, where it's Na plus Cl minus, right? where A minus is the anion from the weak acid. So it wouldn't be, so in this case, uh, 
we'll have to change the A to something like CH3COO minus because it said it's from a weak acid and HCO would be a strong acid anyway. So if this is coming from a weak acid here, then this would be something like CH3COO minus here. And over here, this would be something like OH minus, like something that would be coming off of NaOH, which we haven't talked about that yet, but that's a strong base. <clears throat> which way will the equilibrium lie? It will lie this way, very strongly in this direction, because you have an acid here plus a very strong base OH minus. So what they're going to ask is a couple of more follow-up questions. So let me just answer them. Uh, what's happening here is this equilibrium will lie to the left you'll have mostly reactants because even though this is a stronger base than water and there go my parakeets <clears throat> uh, which uh, you know there's this is as far away as I can get from them so if you can hear those birds in the background that's my parakeets uh, even though a minus is a stronger base than water it's a weaker base than the OH minus here so like the ranking would be that the strongest base if you want to write this down or make a note of it and you want to remember it <clears throat> So let's start off by saying that the conjugate base of a weak acid is a stronger base than water, but it's a weaker base than OH minus. So in other words, what we're saying is if we're looking at all these things in terms of their relative strengths, the OH minus <clears throat> will always be the strongest base. And then uh, the conjugate base of a weak acid and then water and then the conjugate base of a strong acid. So it's kind of like all relative, or, I mean, at least in this case. And uh, I just, I'm just referring to this particular case. Next slide. And now it isn't going again. There we go. <clears throat> all right, so this is going to drive it to the left. Let's go to the next slide. I'm kind of trying to get through this. So we're talking about the relativity here. Uh, so in this particular case, it is relative. Uh, so... Uh, OH minus here would be always strongest. So maybe since we're talking about OH minus, we may as well mention that there are also seven strong bases as well as seven strong acids. And I've got them listed here, but let's just mention them. Sodium hydroxide, and you'll notice that the sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, and cesium hydroxide are all elements from the first column or group, the alkali metals. Every one of these is in that first column. And that's the reason I listed them this way. So if you want to look at your chart, you'll see that. And then these two are two that are from the second column. And they're not like right next to each other. They are kind of spread out in the second column. Anyway, you'll want to remember these. And whenever you see a problem that has these in it, you're going to assume that this is going to be a strong base. Now, we'll talk more later about the difference between strong bases and weak bases, but it's kind of similar to what we said for the difference between strong acids and weak acids in that you have to do the problems differently. And we'll see that in great detail in just a little while. Next slide. So consider a solution of the ionic compound. So this would be a salt. This is going to be something like uh, sodium acetate, where the weak acid would be acetic acid, CH3COOH, which gives up a proton and makes water and then you have something like NaOH which is a strong base where the OH minus will go together with the H plus here to make water and you're left with the A minus here and the Na from the NaOH is here. This is called a salt. So the NaA minus thing here is called a salt. Uh, if the A minus comes from the weak acid here then uh, is this, so this is a continuation actually of the previous problem is the value for KB here going to be greater than or less than one? So notice here, this is a KB expression. I mean, I I'm kind of trying to wait till we talk about it in detail until we finish talking about acids and then we start talking about bases. But this is a base uh, plus water. Okay, whenever you have that, you have a KB expression and it will equal the products over the reactants. So will it be less than one or greater than one? The answer is it's gonna be less than one which we talked about a moment ago. Uh, so I'm going to go to the next slide if I can get this thing to go. I mean, I'm already I like having to kind of rush and now I can't get this thing to, to work right. But, but that's typical. So next slide. Uh, and then let's go to the next slide. You can always pause this uh, if you're watching on YouTube, which you probably are. Uh, just pause it if you didn't catch something and just uh, 
sit there and, and take as much time as you need. But uh, I'm, again, trying to keep the length of this video short. So here's another one. Uh, does this mean that A minus is stronger or weaker? And this is kind of a trick question. It's depending on what you're comparing it to here. If you're comparing A minus here with water, then it's strong. But if you're comparing it with OH minus, it's weak. So again, the hierarchy is like at the top, you would have the OH minus. And then under that, you would have the conjugate base of a weak acid. And then under that, you would have water. And then under that, you would have, which we don't have it here, but you would have the conjugate base of a strong acid. <clears throat> so that would be the order. Next slide. There we go. OK, so let's go to the next slide. You can pause here if you want. Uh, go. OK, <clears throat> acetic acid, CH3COOH, and HCN are both weak acids. But acetic acid is a stronger acid than HCN, so arrange these from weakest to strongest. So just to kind of cut to the chase here, this is the conjugate base of a strong acid, HCl. So it's going to be the weakest. And then the strongest is going to be one of these two. Uh, because they're both conjugate bases of weak acids. And then right in the middle is going to be the water here. Okay, so you'll want to make sure that you understand this. Uh, even if you just have to memorize it, you or mean either understand it or memorize it. Now, how would you tell the difference between these two? Well, use your rule that the stronger acid produces the weaker conjugate base. So if acetic acid is stronger than HCN, that's this one, then it's going to produce a weaker conjugate base uh, than the CN minus. So <clears throat> going from weakest to strongest, this is going to be the weakest. So that's like number one and then number two here and number three here. And that uh, if I don't raise my finger up, it draws the line all the way across. And then HCN is going to be number four. Next slide. Next. <clears throat> next. <clears throat> uh, next. Next. Next, I'm just going to keep clicking now, so you can pause this at any time. Next, and let's go to the next slide. Discuss whether the value of K equilibrium for this equilibrium. Now, notice here we don't have this uh, expression as a Ka or Kb, uh, because we would have to have a weak acid plus water, right? So that's why we're calling this just K equilibrium, not Ka or Kb. OK, so we've got HCN plus F minus gives CN minus NHF. In other words, we've got a, a weak acid on the right and a weak acid on the left. And we're adding the conjugate base of this weak acid over here and this conjugate base is over here. Which way will it go? So you want to look to see which one of these two acids, either HCN or HF, is stronger. And the way that you can tell is by looking at the Ka value. These are both weak acids. But the Ka value for the HF is much, much. It's a million times larger than the Ka for HCN. In other words, this acid is a million times stronger than this one. So which way do you think it's going to go? And you're right, it's going to go this way because the stronger acid will drive the equilibrium to the left. <clears throat> now, if you wanted to figure out what the K value will be, this K equilibrium here will just be the weaker acid Ka value divided by the stronger. So it will just be 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10 divided by 7.2 times 10 to the minus fourth. And that's going to answer the questions on the next few slides. So I'm just going to start skipping, but I'll pause at each slide in case you want to stop and look at it. So next, next, whoops, no, let me leave this here for just a second so you can pause it. Uh, next, <clears throat> uh, next, Next, and I think there's actually a couple of slides here. Next, so what I did was I actually um, did this kind of a long way. Next, so I did it kind of a long way. All you have to remember is divide the weaker Ka by the stronger Ka, uh, and that will give you the same answer that you would get if you did it the way I did it here. I just did it here so that people that were interested could see how you would do it like theoretically. Next slide. Uh, pH. OK, so let's talk about pH. Uh, pH is a scale that we use to tell how acid something is or how acidic something is. So things that have a very low pH uh, are very acidic. Things that have a high pH, like you know, 11, 12, 13, are not acidic. They're basic, actually. <clears throat> Basically, people 
consider the skill to go from 0 to 14, but that's actually not accurate. If you have a strong acid and its concentration happens to be greater than 1 mole per liter, then you can actually have a negative number. Uh, and the same thing on the other end, if you have a base that's more than 1 molar, strong base that's more than 1 molar, then it will actually be more than 14. So, I mean, so it's going to be a little bit less than 0 all the way up to a little bit more than 14. Next slide. Every time you change the pH by 1, you're actually having a power of 10 change. So this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, and when we say logarithmic, we mean uh, the log that is the base 10 log, not the other one. <clears throat> so uh, as you increase the H plus concentration, and this is a little confusing sometimes, uh, as you increase the concentration of the H plus, you decrease the pH. So it goes in the reverse direction. And I still, to this day, if I don't catch myself, have a tendency to get this messed up. So you'll have to really watch that. And then for sig figs, I'll try to remember to point these out as we do the problems if I have time. Uh, whatever number of sig figs you have when you have your concentration, like let's say it says it's 2.2 molar, that's two sig figs. So you'd want to put in two decimal places in your pH. So if you get a value of 7 for your pH, you'd write it as 7.00. So if you don't have anything there, just put O's there. Uh, next slide. So if the pH is 7, we say it's neutral. If it's more than 7, it's basic. Again, it's easy to get this confused. Uh, and if it's less than 7, it's acidic. Next. And this is a slide that's showing a scale of different things that you may be familiar with, like black coffee here. Um, is down in the acidic area. Baking soda is up in the basic area. Ammonia is way up in the basic area. So you can look at, and here's one molar NaOH. Notice it has a pH of 14. One molar HCl has a pH here of zero. <clears throat> Battery acid is just above HCl. Stomach acid is a little bit above that. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. You can look at that if you want. So find the pH for each of the following solutions. So what you do to get the pH, the P there stands for minus the log, and it's the base 10 log. So in other words, uh, the log, for example, of this number right here is just minus 4. It's the number that the 10 is raised to. We call that the log. So the log of 1 times 10 to the minus 4th is minus 4. The pH would be minus the log of the number. <clears throat> so it would be minus a minus 4, so it would be plus 4. And we have two sig figs there, so we want to write it as 4.00, which I'm not going to write all these out because it takes too long, and plus you can't read it anyway. Uh, so, yeah, it would be minus a minus 4, which is plus 4. So the pH here would be 4. And then for this one, notice you have to watch it because they gave you OH minus. So we'll go to the next slide, actually, and look at this. This is 4 times 10 to the minus second. So I'm just going to just give you a ballpark way to do this. It's between uh, 10 to the minus second and 10 to the minus first. So let's just call it uh, minus 1.5. So minus a minus 1.5 would be a plus 1.5. It isn't really. That's not the right answer, but it's close. Um, so, But that wouldn't be the pH. That would be the pOH. So... I mean, they kind of stuck this in kind of early here because you haven't talked about pOH really yet. But to get the pH, you have so we have to kind of get ahead of what we're uh, the point here that we're at. But to get the pH from the pOH, you have to subtract the pOH from 14. So I mean, it's okay. We'll just go ahead and mention it now. So it would be about 12.5, and then you'd have to have let's see, we we have two sig figs here. These two zeros are leading zeros, and they don't have to be there. So we have two sig figs. So uh, what did I say, 12.5? So it, you'd have to write it as 12.50. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. And it's actually, and I knew that that was not exactly right, but I just said I was going to try to give you a ballpark figure. So for B, it's 12.60. And for A, it was 4.00. And if you don't have the slightest idea how I just did that, let me go through it again real quickly. So uh, for the first one, we're trying to find the pH if the concentration 
is 1 times 10 to the minus 4th molar. So here's the deal. Just type in 1 times 10 to the minus 4th into your calculator and take the base 10 log of that. I mean, if you can't just look at it, which maybe you can't, and that's okay. And you should get minus 4. And then what you want to do is you want to take the negative of that. So it would be minus a minus 4, which is plus 4. So if you write it as plus 4, I'll probably give you credit for it. Technically, you're supposed to write it as 4.00 because you're supposed to have two decimal places. Now, for this one, uh, what we have here is a concentration of, where is it? Okay, I see what I did here. So we started off by saying here that KW is the, well, let's skip that. So the concentration here was 0.04 molar. So there's a couple of different ways you can do all of these problems, and I'm usually just going to show you one way. Uh, so the way that I did it here was I said, okay, if KW has to be 1 times 10 to the four, minus 14th, and if I know the concentration of the OH minus is 0.04 molar, then if I divide 1 times 10 to the minus 14th by 0.04, that will actually give me the concentration of the H+. Plus. So that's what I did. So I actually did it differently than the way I said before. And then I took this number, and then what you would do is just type that number right there into your calculator and take the base 10 log. Now, you don't want to do the LN, the natural log. Okay, so when you do that, then whatever number you get out of that, you take the negative of that. That's what this negative is right here and right here. And so uh, when you do that, you should get, uh, initially, you should get minus 12.60, which you would then change and make it plus 12.60. And if it doesn't have the zero there, you have to put it in. And again, that's because you've got two sig figs here. And that's these two numbers right here, the four and the O after the four. So because you have two sig figs, you want to put in two decimal places. So if you don't already have them, then you have to put in a zero. And if you have more than that, you have to round back. Next slide. All right, for a problem like this, you have to do it differently. So it says the pH of a solution is 5.85. So what's the H plus concentration? So what you have to do for a problem like this is you have to work backwards. And so because we did it before by taking the log, we call this going in reverse thing the anti-log. And the way that you do it is you just raise 10 to the power that they gave you for the pH, but it has to be minus that. So you write it as 10 to the minus 5.85, and that's your answer. And you could actually leave it that way, but you should actually uh, go ahead and take your calculator and type in 10 raised to the minus 5.85 power and see what you get. Uh, next slide. And it's not clicking again. Go. Okay, so uh, 10 raised to the minus 5.85 power, which is what we just said. So if you put that into your calculator, you should get 1.4 times 10 to the minus 6th. Uh, we had two decimal places, so we want two sig figs, and we do have two sig figs here. Next slide. Next. Let me try to get this to go. Okay. Uh, all right, so here is an explanation of what we were saying a moment ago. We said that KW, remember, is another kind of an equilibrium constant. It's the auto dissociation of water. And we said that it always equals 1 times 10 to the minus 14th in pure water. And let me just make a quick comment. I'm, I'm not going to spend any time on it, but <clears throat> regular tap water isn't pure water, as you very well know. Uh, so it won't have a constant of 1 times 10 to the minus 14th. It'll be different. So just be aware of that. So what that means is if you multiply the concentration of the H plus times the concentration of the OH minus, and remember, we usually don't call this H plus, right? We call it H3O plus. Uh, you get 1 times 10 to the minus 14th. So if these are breaking up in equal numbers, that means that both of those should be 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. <clears throat> in their concentrations. Now what I did here was a derivation that clearly I don't have time to go through. But if you want to pause the video and look at it, you can see what I did here. The bottom line is you end up, if you take minus the log of the things at the top of the slide, you get this, which is that the pH plus the pOH equals 14. And I think we've already mentioned this before, but this is where that came from. So we have two different ways we can do the problems. We can, And we've already seen that. We can either take
uh, h plus concentration times OH minus concentration and get 1 times 10 to the minus 14th. Or we can equivalently say that the pH plus the pOH equals 14. And we'll do both of these as we go through these problems. Next slide. All right, now this time we're supposed to find the pOH, which means that we want minus the log of the OH minus concentration. So let's do B first, because we've already got the OH minus concentration. Uh, and that is 4 times 10 to the minus second. We've already done this problem before, uh, but we did it for pH that time. So it's 4 times 10 to the minus second, which means it's about halfway between 10 to the minus second and 10 to the minus third. So the pOH here should be about halfway, or actually, let's see, 4 times 10 to the minus, I'm sorry, it's halfway between uh, 10 to the minus second and 10 to the minus first. So it's going to be about 1.5. And so, but the way that you would do this, okay, I, I, I have a tendency to try to go ahead and do this in my head, uh, so I'll do A in a moment. The way that you would do this on a calculator would be to type in 0.04 and take the log of that, the base 10 log of that, and then whatever you get, you take the negative of that. Uh, and that will give you the pOH. So it's minus the base 10 log of the OH minus concentration. Now you say, wait a minute, no it isn't, it's minus the log of the H plus concentration. No, that's the pH, but they're asking for the pOH here. Uh, so for this one, you have two different ways you could do it. You could either divide that number right there uh, into 1 times 10 to the minus 14th to get the OH minus concentration, and then take um, minus the log of that, or you could just go ahead and get the pH here by saying that that's going to be 4 because the minus 4 here is the log of the H plus concentration. So if you take minus that, you'd get plus 4. So the pH would be plus 4, and we've done this before. So the pOH would just be 14 minus 4, which is 10. Next slide. Okay, so the answer to the first one is 10, uh, and here you can pause this and look at it if you want, and the answer to the second part is 1.4. Let's go to the next slide. The pH of a solution is 5.85. What is the OH minus concentration for this solution? So uh, to get the H plus concentration, do you remember how we did this? Remember we said we have to take the antilog, right? So we just raised 10 to the minus 5.85, and that gave us the H plus concentration. So there are two different ways you can do this one, and that's true of almost all these problems. Uh, so you could either say, okay, the pOH here would be 14 minus 5.85. Then knowing that, you could raise 10 to the whatever you get minus whatever you get for the pOH, and that will give you the OH minus concentration. Or you could figure out what the H plus concentration is, which we actually did that before. It's going to be 10 to the minus 5.85 molar. And then you could uh, divide 1 times 10 to the minus 14th by that number, and that would also give you the OH minus concentration. And I'm going to let you do that as an exercise so we can get going. So next slide. And your answer that you should get would be 7.1 <clears throat> times 10 to the minus 9th molar. Next slide. I think it's because it's so humid. Okay, so let's go on to some actual acid-base problems. So they're going to tell you here some steps you can take. I'm going to go on to the next slide. and We'll do the steps that they just mentioned in that other slide as we do these. Uh, so we have an aqueous solution of 2 times 10 to the minus 3rd molar. Um, okay, so this video may be actually almost two hours long if we keep going at this pace. And that's that's actually too long, but anyway, I, don't, I really don't want to make a part one and a part two, so I may just let it go. Uh, so consider an aqueous solution of 2 times 10 to the minus third molar HCl. What are the major species? First of all, this is a strong acid, so they're maybe not going to ask us to do this, but if they do ask us to find the pH, we just type 2 times 10 to the minus 3rd into our calculator, take the log of that, the base 10 log, and then take the negative of that. Uh, what are the major species going to be? They're not going to be HCl, so we won't have that. 
we'll have H plus, which we're going to write as H3O plus, which I'm not going to write it out, uh, and we'll have Cl minus, right? So it will break up completely as far as we're concerned into H plus and Cl minus, or the, but we're going to write it as H3O plus plus Cl minus. And then you always have water as one of your major species, always. So you'll have three things. You'll have H3O plus, Cl minus, and H2O. Next slide. Um, next slide. What is the pH? It's going to be minus the log of 2 times 10 to the minus third. Next slide. Uh, oh, and then what they're going to do is they're going to go through some uh, preliminary steps here. So next slide. So what I'll do is I'll let you go ahead and read the previous slide and this slide on your own if you want to. So it turns out that in this case, we have two possible sources for H+. One of them would be the water in addition to the acid. But in this case, because the acid is a strong acid, we're going to just worry about that. Uh, and also its concentration is more than it would be if it were if it were coming from the water, it would be, as we just said a moment ago, 10 to the minus seventh, right? So this concentration is much greater than that. So we're going to go with this one. However, for the purposes of just making you think, there are a couple of problems where they will give you a concentration from a strong acid, but they'll make it so that it's less than 10 to the minus seventh. And in that case, you would use the water's H plus concentration instead of the acids because it's it's more. OK, so and we'll see that when we get to that. All right. So here, if you take minus the log of two times 10 to the minus third, you get 2.7 where you want to put in this extra zero to get the right number of decimal places. Next. Uh, all right. So find the pH of 1.5 times 10 to the minus second molar solution of HNO3. First of all, recognize HNO3, that's nitric acid, is one of our strong acids. So just take minus the base 10 log of that number right there, and that's your pH. And notice that this is greater than 10 to the minus 7th. Uh, again, just to tell you why I said that last thing, because if this number right here, for example, was, say, 10 to minus 11, that's actually less H plus coming from there than it would just be coming from the water. So in that kind of a case, you would use the pH of the water, and the pH of the water is just going to be 7. Next slide. So we'll have the H plus, the NO3, whoops, didn't underline, NO3 minus, and that, these two things are coming from the HNO3, and then we'll have water, um, and then next slide. So I'm going to go ahead and let you read this on your own, and I'm going to go to the next slide, uh, and our answer is going to be down here at the bottom, 1.82. And all that is is just minus the base 10 log of the number that we were given for the concentration. So let me just repeat what I said earlier. If it's a strong acid, which it is in this case, then whatever the concentration of the acid is, you just assume that that's going to be the concentration of H+. So really, these are easy problems. It's the ones where you have a weak acid that become more difficult. Next slide. All right, now here's our trick question where they're giving us a strong acid. So your initial temptation is going to be to take minus the base 10 log of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11th, but that would be wrong because they gave us a concentration of this strong acid that is less than the concentration of the H plus that's already in the water from the auto dissociation of water. So use the auto dissociation of water in this case. And that's really the reason why they've been leading up to this by saying, first of all, recognize that you've always got that KW uh, dissociation going on in the background. So the pH here is just going to be 7, and then however many decimal places you need after it, which I think would be 2. So you, and you can see how hard it is for me to write with this bloody thing. So it would actually be 7.00. <clears throat> and I'm writing two zeros here because there are two sig figs here. Next slide. Now it isn't changing. Next, and it isn't changing again. One more time, there we go. So the answer here is gonna be 7.0. For the sake of time, let's move on. Weak acids, okay, so before we get started on these, these are harder. Uh, you can't just do them by typing in a number into your calculator. You have to do what's called an ice table, which we've already talked about in the previous chapter, right? So at least you already know what they are. So we have to use ice tables to do problems to find the pH of weak acids. 
uh, and you'll see why when we get to the next problem. So let's go forward here. So we have a 0.8 molar solution of HCN. First of all, look at this HCN and see, is that one of my seven strung acids? And the answer is no, it's not. So it's got to be a weak acid. If it's not one of the seven strong ones, it's got to be a weak one. And then they give us the K value here. They tell us here that the original concentration is 0.8, but we can't assume that the concentration of H plus here will be a 0.8 as we were doing before with the strong acids because this isn't a strong acid, so it won't break up very much. So the way we have to do this is we have to set up an ice table. And I'm going to go ahead and just go on to the next slide and we'll look at this. So for a weak acid, your major species won't be H plus CN minus an H2O, and you have to remember that. It will be HCN and it's not dissociated. Only a little bit of this stuff right here is going to dissociate. And then always, as we mentioned before, you always have water. So the major species will be the set HCNH2O. And the primary equilibrium will be a Ka expression. And that's what we're going to use for our ice table to write across the top. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so again, we have both equilibria present where we have the one that we just mentioned, the Ka, and then we also have the auto dissociation of water. Uh, but in this particular case, the one that we care about is this one. So we're going to have the HCN and the water reacting, and it's going to produce H3O plus from where the H plus comes off the HCN and adds to the water, and that will leave us with CN minus. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Next. Calculate the pH of a 0.5 molar aqueous solution of the weak acid HF. So here they're giving us the concentration. Don't just take minus the log of that because you can't do that for weak acids. We have to do these differently. <clears throat> then they give us the Ka. Let's go to the next slide. So here I've gone ahead and I've written out the uh, equilibrium, the Ka expression. It's HF plus H2O. We always have to have H2O here. Uh, and it's going to give H3O plus when the H plus comes off and goes on the water and leave us with F minus. So you will actually have to be able to produce this on your own here because it may not be given to you. And that's what's going to go across the top of your ice table. Okay, so you'll write it just this way. Your equilibrium expression will be concentration of this times concentration of this divided by the concentration of this and leave out the water. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, so the major species we've already done. Let's go to the next slide. It'll just be the weak acid and water. Next slide. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and let you look at this on your own. We're going to use this equilibrium, not this one, not the KW one. And that will almost always be the case. Uh, basically, like almost always, the only time it wouldn't be the case would be in a situation like the one that we had a few minutes ago where they gave us a concentration of a strong acid that was actually less than 10 to the minus seventh. So uh, we're going to use the one on the top. Uh, and let me just, I don't know why I put a check there, but let me mark it out. So we're going to use this one. Let me put another check there. Uh, and this is going to go across the top of the ice table. Next slide. Uh, and next. So I mean, a lot of these, they're just going through a lot of slides. So you may want to pause these and make sure you understand everything before you go to the next slide. Next. Okay, so here we've got the ice table, and notice that we didn't write H2O plus H2O gives H3O plus plus OH minus. That would have been the o, uh, auto dissociation of water, but that has a lower K value by far as compared to the K value for this one. So this is the one we want to use. But just be aware that it's usually, I mean, basically for your purposes, it's probably always going to be not the H2O plus H2O one. It's there, though, so just be aware that it's there, but it's almost always, I mean, probably 100% of the time for your purposes. It's going to be the weak acid plus water that you're going to want here. Okay, so for this table, the only thing we know, and I have it in bold here, is the initial concentration of HF. Uh, everything else we don't know, we're going to assume zero here for H3O plus, and we're also going to assume zero for F minus. Uh, it's actually not exactly zero for H3O plus because we have 
10 to the minus 7th molar H3O plus always present, but that's so small that we're just going to neglect it for this. So just put 0. If you want to put the little squiggly line, you can. That just means it's approximately 0. And then our stoichiometry is 1 here, 1 here. I don't know if you can see where I'm marking, and 1 here. I'm marking red here. So it, in, in other words, it's 1 to 1 to 1. So we're going to write minus x on the left-hand side of the arrow for the reactants. And we don't care about this part because it's, it's not going to change. And then over on the right-hand side of the arrow, it's going to be plus x and plus x, not 2 or 3 because all of these numbers here, as we said before, are 1. So here we're going to get 0.5 minus x, and here we're going to get 0 plus x is x. Same thing here. So the Ka value, which was given to us, it's 7.2 e minus 4, will equal x times x divided by 0.5 minus x. But we're going to start off by just assuming that that x is negligible. And we're going to just say that Ka, which is 7.2 e minus 4, equals x squared over 0.5. Next slide. Uh, which is what I have right here. And then if you go ahead and solve for x there, you get that x is 0 0.019. And then I can't go back to the slide, but, but if you want to go back to the previous slide and just look at that chart, that ice table, uh, find x, and you'll see that it equaled two things. It equaled the h plus and the f minus. But what we really care about is the h plus because that's how we can figure out the pH, right? So that then what that means is that the concentration of h plus is 0 0.019 molar. So to get the pH, we just take minus the log of 0 0.019, and we're going to get minus a minus 1.72, which is plus 1.72. And if we go back and check our x, once we figured out what x was, if we compare it with the original concentration, which was 0.5, we see that it is less than 5%. However, I'm, I'm going to say this again, it may be more than 5% in a couple of the more difficult, tedious problems, and we're just going to go ahead and go with it. Next slide. All right, so when we've been figuring out that error stuff where we take the x that we figure out and divide it by the original concentration, it turns out that we're actually doing something else, even though we didn't know it. We're actually doing something called the percent dissociation. So like, I, I can't go back, but I, if you want to go back and look, I think the number that we came up with for the error there was like 3.8% or 3.7% or something like that. So that actually turns out to be something we call the percent dissociation. And what that means is uh, how much of the original stuff that, like in that case, it was HF, right? So how much of that HF that we had originally dissociated? And it was like 3.8% or something like that. So we call that the percent dissociation. So we do that exactly the same way that we figure out what the error would be. Uh, and then let's just read this statement. For a given weak acid, the percent dissociation increases as the acid becomes more dilute. We'll come back to this later. Uh, when, when we say dilute something, we mean we add water to it. If we add water, well, I'll let you read this part at the bottom on your own if you want to. And let's go to the next slide, and we'll come back to this. Next slide. So let's do an example of what we were just talking about. We're supposed to uh, find the Ka value. So this is going to be a problem where we're going to have to kind of work backwards. So they're telling us that this formic acid is 0.47%, and you'll have to learn how to convert this to a decimal. So I will take a moment and just try to write this out. Uh, if you wanted to convert that to a decimal, you have to move the decimal place back two places to the left, or if you want to think of it as dividing by 100, and get rid of the percent sign. So it's like when you make a percentage, well, it's just like here what we're doing is we're doing that in reverse. We're undoing the percentage. And so we're just making this into a decimal. So 0.47% would be the same thing as 0 0.0047. All right, so the way that you have to do this kind of a problem here is you have to multiply the original concentration by your x value. And that will, or I'm sorry, times, not times the x, times the 0 0.0047 uh, value, which is the amount of it that's going to be ionized. And then when you multiply those two things together, that will give you your x.
Now here we're dealing with formic acid, and the answers are on one of the following slides. Uh, so we would have across the top HCOOH, which is formic acid. That's the stuff in ant bites that makes them sting, plus H2O, because we have to have water always, and then it's going to give us COOH minus plus H3O plus. So when we figure out this X thing, we're figuring out the concentration of the H3O plus. Uh, and also we're figuring out what X is. Uh, so to get the Ka value, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll look, or maybe it may be another slide after that next. Uh, it won't go. Uh, so here I've set it up. I'll let you pause and look at that uh, if you want to next. Okay, so notice what we did was we multiplied the 8 times the 0 0.0047, where that 0 0.0047 is the decimal we got from this percentage here. So let me draw an arrow there. And, and when we multiplied those together, we got the 0.038 here, which we're going to put in where the x was here. Actually, it's in all four of these, right? It's in all four of these squares here because there were x's in all four of these. This one, this one, this one, and this one. These were all x, so they're all 0.038. And then to get the equilibrium... Uh, <clears throat> concentration of the HCOOH, we have to take what we started with and subtract X. And since we know what X is in this particular example, we can just go ahead and put it in and we get that it's 7.962. So to get Ka, which is what we're trying to find, we multiply that. In other words, the products, which is going to be that times that. All the numbers in front here are ones and I'll write them up on the top because it's easier to see. I can't, they don't show up that well if I write them in the orange. So 1 and 1 to 1, so we multiply this one times this one and divide it by this one. And that will give us our Ka value, which I think is on the next slide. So 0 0.038 times 0 0.038 divided by 7.962 gives us this number, which I wrote in scientific notation, as 1.8 times 10 to the minus fourth. Next slide. Uh, all right, now calculate the pH, and we're going to use the data from the previous slide. And all you have to do here is just find what the X was, which I can't go backwards. But uh, if you want to back it up, uh, whatever we got for the X was the H3O plus concentration, uh, which I mentioned at the time. So just take minus the log of that, and that will give you the pH. And that's all you have to do. Next. Okay, so... Uh, for X over there, let's see, what did we get? We got 0.038, right? Uh, so take minus the log of 0.038. If you look back at that ice table, the 0.038 was like at the bottom of one of the products, which, I mean, every time I start writing something, I always regret it because it's just like, it's just like I can just watch time passing by. Old man time is just marching by, and I'm just sitting here trying to write this stuff. If you look back up at the top, it's H3O plus, right? And I'm not even going to try to write it. So anyway, so that's what it is. So look at the chart, find the X, look back up at the top of the column the X is in, and that's what the X is. That's what it stands for. Uh, in this case, it also stood for the COOH minus, but we don't care about that in this problem because they're asking for the pH here. And to get the pH, we don't need the COOH, uh, the HCOO minus, we need the H3O plus. <clears throat> They're both the same. So take minus the log of the 0 0.038 and you get 1.42. So the pH here is going to be 1.42. Um, and now we're just a little bit over halfway through and we're just about an hour. Uh, so good grief. Uh, next slide. And it isn't helping any that I can't get this thing to move forward. All right. This one is a trick exercise. So you have to watch them. Uh, the value of Ka, so why don't you think about this? I'll see if you, you can pick this up on your own. Uh, for, for molar formic acid, it should be higher than, lower than, or the same as the value of Ka for 8 molar. So watch this one. It's going to be, and I mean, if you haven't figured it out by now, you probably won't. It's going to be the same. Because remember we said that K values are constant. That's why they're called K, right? Uh, the only thing that can change a constant is what? You remember from the last chapter? if you change the temperature. But they didn't say anything about changing the temperature here. They just diluted it. <clears throat> so it was originally 8 molar, and they added enough water to make it drop down to 4 molar. 4 molar is less concentrated. Next slide. 
So it's going to be the same as. <clears throat> next slide. Uh, okay, next slide. Now for the next one, they're going to say the percent ionization of a diluted solution. And that should be higher than the percent ionization of the original. Because when you add water, you're adding a reactant which drives the equilibrium to the right. That means more of it is going to ionize. So the answer here is going to be higher than. Let's go to the next slide. This is helping a little bit because it's getting us through some of these slides. So you can pause here uh, and read what I just said there. And I'm going to go to the next slide uh, and then the next one. <clears throat> and then also, this is important. I'm trying to stand up while I talk. Uh, even though we have an increase in the percent ionization, we also added more water. And the net result of that, which is not really something you would be able to think about in your mind and just come to the, this conclusion, but it actually turns out that we wind up with it being more dilute. Because even though we ionized more of the H3O+, plus, we also added more water. So it turns out that the concentration of the H3O+, plus is going to be lower than it was before. So the pH will be higher. And again, <clears throat> this is one of those situations where you have to be careful if you have a higher in increase in H+, plus, the pH would be lower. In this case, we have a lower concentration of H+, plus, so the pH will be higher. And it's easier just to remember that everything is going to be higher here. So the percent ionization will be higher, and also the pH will be higher. Next slide. So I can see what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to get to a certain point where we're going to get to some theoretical stuff. And when we reach that point, in order to try to uh, reduce the, the time on this video. I'm going to have to just kind of like speed through that. So it's theoretical stuff. So I'll go through it. I'll explain it. And then you can also read it on your own. <clears throat> and I think that'll be all right. Uh, anyway, so let's go ahead and, and keep going here. So the diluted solution will have a higher percent dissociation and it will also have a higher pH. <clears throat> the H3O plus concentration will be lower but that means that the pH will be higher. Again, it's counterintuitive. Next slide. And this is just summing up what we just said. We've already said it, so let's go to the next slide. So the pH of a four molar, this is the dilute one, and this was the concentrated one here, the eight. So once we dilute it, both the percent ionization and the pH should be higher than the original uh, solution. So let's go to the next slide. Next, next, calculate the percent ionization of a four molar formic acid solution in water. The Ka is 1.80 minus four. Uh, all right, so what are we gonna do here? What we're gonna have to do is go through the problem uh, starting with four molar, we'll have to write out our uh, equilibrium uh, and we'll also have to set up the equilibrium expression and then we'll want to write the equilibrium across the top. And we'll have to solve for x and then divide that by the original concentration of 4. So this is going to be a little bit complicated, but it's not difficult. It's just you, you'll get to the point where you can do it just automatically. Um, all right, so um, what else do I want to say before we go on? Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to do is first of all write, let's just do it now and then we'll flip. First of all, let's just write the equilibrium. And we want it to be where it's a Ka expression because they gave us Ka here. So it's formic acid, and the formula for that is HCOOH plus what? So think about it for just a second. <clears throat> we always have to add what to get Ka or Kb expressions? Water. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it would be HCOOH plus water, and it's going to produce H3O plus plus HCOO minus. Now, you also have the auto dissociation of water going on, which is another equilibrium, which we're not going to write across the top of the ice table because its constant is 10 to the minus 14th. And I mean, I don't know what the constant is here. Well, yes, I do because they give it to us. It's 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4th. That's like 10 to the 10th times larger than Kw. So we're going to write this one across the top of our ice table, the one that I just said. Uh, so at that point, what we'll do is we'll write four for, so like here's our ice table. And so we write what I just said across the top, 
and then right here for the initial concentration of the formic acid you'll write four and that's all you know right now <clears throat> so just assume over here on the other side here's your arrows uh, and then assume that over here on the other side of these arrows you've got zeros here because they don't tell us anything differently <clears throat> and then what's our stoichiometry uh, it's going to be one to one to one so just you'll have minus x here and then you'll have plus x here and plus x here so you'll wind up with x and x down here at the bottoms for your h3o plus and your hcoo minus uh, and over here you'll have four minus x so let's go to the next slide and look at it mm, go try it again. wow <clears throat> i mean it's always a little bit stubborn but today it's being particularly stubborn and i'm wondering if it's because it's so humid because <clears throat> we just got a torrential rain last night here uh in college station anyway so we got this by just adding what they gave us in the problem statement to water and figured out and let me just go through this in case you're still not quite catching this the h plus will come off of your acid and go on the water and produce h3o plus over here and that will leave you with uh, hcoo minus which we write over here now we could have written the auto dissociation of water across here and it would have been wrong because the constant for that again is 10 to the minus 14th where the constant for this one is much 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 larger it's 10 to the minus 4 so that is the determining factor so we write this equilibrium across the top the only thing that we knew originally was this 4 here uh, so but we also know that it's 1 here 1 here and 1 here so 1 to 1 to 1 so every time we lose x on the left we gain x on the right for everything so just write this is 4 minus x so anyway when you get to this point your Ka will equal products over reactants raised to their coefficients. So it's going to be x times x over 4 minus x. And then just assume that x is negligible. Uh, the, the only times that really causes problems is usually if your initial concentration is really tiny, like 0.1 or something like that. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see some examples of that, unfortunately. So uh, x times x over 4 equals the Ka which was given to you as 1.8 e minus 4. So just use this equation right here to solve for x. And that's how you'll do all these problems. And it's, oh, sorry. And it's also how you'll do the KB problems later on, except that you have to set them up differently. Okay, so when you solve this for x, you get 0.027, um, <clears throat> which turns out to be much less than 5%. So we're good to go here and again even if we weren't we uh, oftentimes we'll, we'll just go ahead and go on anyway <clears throat> so x is 0.027 now I can point out what I was trying to say in the previous problem so look at the x and see what it stands for it stands for either the h3o plus which is what we do care about and it also stands for hco minus which we don't care about the reason we care about the h3o plus in this particular case is because we can use that to find the ph now, if it wants to know the concentration of every species, and that's the way they usually phrase it, or all species, then we would care about this one too, this one right here, because that's one of the species. So we would have to get the HCOOH by taking 4 and subtracting what we found X to be, which is 0.027. And then these two things here would both be 0.027, the two things there at the top. And then, uh, let's see, <clears throat> if you wanted to, you could also figure out the OH minus concentration by dividing 1 times 10 to the minus 14th by this number right here. That would give you the OH minus concentration, but you don't have to do that. Uh, anyway, so when we divide this number X that we got <clears throat> by 4, which was the original concentration here, then we get 0.67%. Now, we did this because they asked us to find the percent dissociation, and that's the answer. However, be aware that when we do this, we also simultaneously figure out what our error was, and it's 0.67. In other words, it's less than 1%. Next slide. <clears throat> and then to calculate the pH, I mean, I can't, again, I can't go back, but uh, just take that number that we got, which I think was 0.027, and take minus the base 10 log of that. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
and we get so minus the base 10 log of 0.027 is 1.57 so that is the pH okay so hopefully you're starting to see how these work they're not particularly difficult and you'll get to the point where you can do them uh, I mean eventually by the time we get through chapter 17 B uh, you'll be able to do these ice tables either just by just taking a few seconds and jotting them down or I mean you may even get to the point where you can do them in your head next slide okay let's move on to bases so bases are done the same way except that they go in the reverse direction so they can be a little mind-boggling because you have to say okay this is how it would be if it was an acid but we're doing it in reverse <clears throat> so again we have the same spiel here for bases originally they were supposed to be things that produced OH minus uh, and then they said no they're going to be proton acceptors that was Bronsted Lauer and that's the one that we're going to use most of the time in our course and then there's another one called the Lewis concept, which would be that uh, bases are either proton acceptors or electron donors, which we'll talk about that a little bit uh, <clears throat> at the end of this chapter, if I have time. Uh, so the strong bases I've already mentioned to you before, but here they are again. And notice that I've got them listed so that these first five are all things that are from the first group, the alkali metals, <clears throat> lithium, sodium, cesium, rubidium, and potassium. And if, if you have a chart you might want to double check that and see that that's the case and then barium and calcium are from the second column so they have to have two OH minuses uh, and then down at the bottom we say that the POH is minus the base 10 log of the OH minus concentration not the H plus and that pH equals uh, 14 minus POH next slide oh it worked Calculate the pH of 1 times 10 to the minus third molar solution of sodium hydroxide. So we are going to have a concentration here. We're going to assume that the concentration of the hydroxide or the OH minus will be the same as the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Any ideas why? Well, the same thing is with the strong acids. We're going to assume that the sodium hydroxide will completely dissociate. So if the original sodium hydroxide was mixed to be 1 times 10 to the minus third molar, then we're going to assume that it will completely break up when you put it in the water to make the solution so that the solution's concentration of hydroxide ion will also be 1 times 10 to the minus third. So if I take minus the base 10 log of 1 times 10 to the minus third, which is going to be 3, because the log there is minus 3, so minus that would be plus 3, that's going to give me the pOH. So the pOH would be 3 with two decimal places again, so 3.00. But they don't want that. So watch this, because they don't want pOH, they want pH, which is going to be 11. Let's go to the next slide, if I can get it to go. Try it again. Okay, so uh, it's 11. Uh, so that's how you do these. So just be real careful with these problems. Make sure you're answering what they're asking. It's very frustrating to do the whole problem and do all that work and then answer it. And then you see later you get your test back and it was wrong because you answered the wrong question. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Calculate the pH of a similar solution, but this time it's calcium hydroxide. The formula, which I'm not going to write, is CaOH2. Therefore, if it completely breaks up, we're going to have a concentration of OH minus, not of 1, but 2 times 10 to the minus 3rd. So you'll do it the same way. Take minus the log of 2. So let me just write 2 above here, because when this breaks up, it's going to produce... Each one of those formula units will produce one calcium and two hydroxides. So the concentration will be 2 times 10 to the minus third. So type that number into your calculator. Take minus the log of that. And let's go to the next slide and look at the answer, if I can get it to go. Well, that's frustrating. Uh, you're going to get that the pOH is minus and minus 2.70 which is 2.70 plus 2.70 again however that's the pOH so we're finding the concentration of hydroxide we're taking minus the log of that will that will give us the pOH but they don't want that they want pH so subtract that from 14 and then you get what they do want so if it's 2.7 for the pOH the pH which is what they want 
is going to be 14 minus 2.7, which is going to be 11.3. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so for weak bases, we do these things the same way we did for weak acids, which I've mentioned before. So for example, CN minus, we already know that's a weak base. So if we add water to that, we have ourselves a KB expression. And it would be set up the same way as the KAs. So everything is going to be analogous for KB as for KA, but you really have to be careful because it's it's confusing. I mean, even for me now, it still confuses me at times because it, you have to think in reverse kind of like. So for example here, if you start off with CN minus and you add it to water, you're not going to end up over here on the right hand side with H3O plus. And we get used to that. We get used to having H3O plus over there. If you're not thinking about what you're doing, it's easy to just write that down. And remember that <clears throat> one of the tricks to these problems is for a lot of them, when you're taking a test, you actually have to supply that thing on top there. And so be careful when you're doing that for bases because you want to write OH minus. So what happens here is the CN minus is a base, not an acid. So when it reacts with water, it actually takes off an H plus. It doesn't put it on. And that leaves the water as OH minus. And then it makes the CN minus into an acid. So it's backwards. So it gets a little confusing. <clears throat> so uh, equilibrium expression will be that the KB will equal your products raised to their respective powers of coefficients. So it would be, in this case, HCN times OH minus over CN minus. And again, you just leave the water out of it because it's a pure liquid, right? So you would end up with something like this. So again, when you solve for X in an ice table, it, like for OH minus, if you start with zero and you have plus X here, and I'm already regretting that I started writing this. Uh, anyway, down at the bottom here, you're going to wind up with X. So when you solve for X for these uh, weak base problems, you're actually getting the concentration of the OH minus. So when you take minus the log of that, you get POH. So uh, usually they'll ask it in terms of pH. Usually that's what they want. So you'll have to subtract at the end from 14 to get your answer. Next. Uh, so I think you already know this stuff, so let's go to the next slide. So find the pH of a two molar solution of ammonia. Now we can't just do this the way we did for NaOH. Why? Why can't we just take minus the log of two? Well, it's because ammonia is not a strong base, right? Remember, all of the strong bases were hydroxides. Now, let me give you a caveat to that. Not all hydroxides, I mean, there's a whole bunch of hydroxides, way more than seven. Uh, there's a whole bunch of transition metals that make hydro hydroxides, and most of those are not strong bases. So just because you see hydroxide on something doesn't mean it's a strong base. So anything that isn't one of the seven things I mentioned, you can consider it to be a weak base, even if it's a hydroxide. Uh, and anyway, for ammonia, yeah, that's definitely a weak base. So uh, to do this, we do this the same way we did for weak acids. We have to set up an ice table. So here's our KB, not KA. <clears throat> and since the ammonia does not break up, major species will be the ammonia and then the ever-present water. So we have our equilibrium uh, in addition to the auto dissociation of water. Just want to point that out. Uh, we will have the weak base plus what? It always has to be what? It always has to be water. So that makes this a KB expression. If that were anything but water, it would not be a KB expression. And you could not set it equal to KB. Uh, and then you've got NH4 plus where the H plus has come off the water and gone on the NH3. So now it's NH4 plus, which is called ammonium ion. And that leaves the water as OH minus. So this is what you would write across the top of your ice table. Next slide. And it didn't go. So for this problem, we started off with two molar here. And we're assuming zeros here and here. And we have one to one to one. That's always very nice. So minus x on this side and then plus x on this side for both of them. We wind up with x here and on the right and on the left, 2 minus x. 2 is kind of a small number. 
the two molar, so, I mean, you'd have to watch that, <coughs> theoretically anyway, uh, to see if your percentage is okay, which I don't have any notes here, so I'm assuming it was. <clears throat> Actually, two isn't really that small. It's usually when you have something like, as I said before, like 0.1, that you start to run into problems with that error rate. So anyway, so you've got x times x on the right divided by 2 on the left, where we're neglecting the x, and that's going to equal kb, which for ammonia, it just happens by coincidence to be the same numerical number, or I, I was going to say numerical value, as the ka for acetic acid. And we use acetic acid most of the time, uh, or more, more frequently than anything else, when we do weak acid problems, and we use ammonia more frequently than anything else to do KB problems, and they have the same number, which is weird. Anyway, so, but it makes it easy to remember. So 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth equals X squared, which is coming from right here, X times X divided by what's on the uh, reactant side, which is just two. We're gonna assume that that X right there is negligible. Solve for X, and to do that, you have to take the square root uh, of a number and you get 0 0.006 and then look back at your chart uh, what is X so let me see if I can draw a line here it is NH4 plus but we don't care about that right now but it's also OH minus and we do care about that because if we take minus the log of that we get the POH so let's take minus the log of that and we get that the POH is 2.22 however as always, they didn't ask for POH, or not always, but most of the time. So we have to subtract 14 minus 2.22 to get the pH, and that's usually what they want. Not always, but most of the time. Next slide. All right, polyproduct acids would be something like H2SO4, where you have more than one proton that can be donated, or H3PO4. Uh, the problems that we do typically are H3PO4 problems, where you have three protons. So let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, we're not actually going to go through this very much. Uh, gosh, I'm almost at an hour and a half already. So there's a rule that you want to remember. For polyproduct acids, mainly... In fact, for pH problems, all you really want to worry about is the first proton. In other words, the one that's going from H2SO4 to make it HSO4 minus plus H plus. Or for H3PO4, it would be the H3PO4 going to H2PO4. And that's all you have to worry about for pH problems because the first constant is about 10,000, or no, it's actually 100,000 times greater than the second constant. So you can just neglect Ka2 and Ka3 here. This would be for H3PO4. You can just forget about them in a pH problem. The only time you have to worry about it is if you're trying to find the concentration of something that you don't get unless you do all three steps. And in the past, we've had, we, we have a problem in the work problems where you actually do have to do that. You have to find the concentration of PO4, 3 minus. And to do that, you have to do all three steps. You have to do an ice table for the first step, in a nice table for the second step and so forth. But to find the pH for a polyprotic acid, you don't have to do that. You just have to do the first step uh, because again, the Ka for the first step is about 100,000 times more than Ka2. Next slide. So here we have a first example for H3PO4 where uh, we're going, let's see, which one are we doing here? Find the pH, okay. So for this problem, we don't have to worry about this one or this one. Uh, however, in the work problems, we have another problem like this where we have to find the concentration of the PO4, 3 minus. And for that one, we have to do all three steps. However, I've, I used to ask that as a bonus question, and I might still do that, but it's so long and so tedious that I've gotten to the point where I, I really don't even like to ask it. But for this problem, all we have to do is worry about that Ka value. And so our expression is going to just be H3PO4 plus water gives H3O plus plus H2PO4 minus, where the H2PO4 minus is going to be our conjugate base. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> So, and the concentration of the H3PO4 was 1, and everything else, as always, we're going to assume 0 for this and this. And it's, again, 1 to 1 to 1, so we just have minus x on the left and plus x on the right. Now, notice that this time we've got only a 1 here, uh, 
and that's a kind of a small number. And it turns out that if you do this problem uh, and then compare back to the original concentration, that your error is more than 5%. So that's another complication to this particular problem that makes me tend to not want to ask it. Because really, even though it doesn't help that much, uh, technically, though, you're still supposed to go back and say, well, let's do it over again and use the quadratic equation. So if you want to do that, you have to leave in this minus x, okay? And just go ahead and do it algebraically and then get it set up so that you've got some kind of x squared minus or plus some x plus a constant equals zero and figure out what is your a, what is your b, and what is your c. And if you do that, you should get that the a is 1, the b is 0 0.075, and the c is minus 0 0.075. And then you can either go to a web page, but I mean, you couldn't do that on a test. So on a test, you'd actually have to do it out longhand, which is why I don't like to ask it on tests. Doesn't mean that I wouldn't do it, but if I did, it would just be a bonus problem. Um, anyway, but if you do that, notice that you get the X, which was originally the error at 8.6%, drops it only to 8.3%. So, I mean, you're still way over 5%. So is it worth it? Well, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but so when I did this, I got that X is 0 0.0829. And look back at the chart and you see that that stands for either the H3O plus or the H2PO4 minus. And then when you subtract that from one, that's going to give you the concentration of the H3PO4 at equilibrium. Then you want to multiply this X times itself and divide it by the equilibrium concentration, which you got by subtracting the 0 0.0829, which is 0 0.917. So you want to multiply this right here by itself and then divide it by that, and that's going to give you the Ka. Next slide. Also, if you take minus the log of 0 0.0829, which was our x, you get the pH, which is what they were asking for. Now, that is the answer for this problem, and that is correct. However, let me just repeat what I said earlier. If you were going to try to find something like the concentration of the PO4 3 minus, you'd have to do it two more times. Uh, you'd have to do it for the second step and the third step, and that's actually done in the work problem, so we'll worry about that later. Let's go to the next slide. All right, and then salt problems. I don't have a lot in your work problems about this, but there is a little bit. But basically, salt problems are when you're told that you start off not with an acid or a base, but with a salt. But they always wind up being weak base problems. Because what you're going to wind up with is some ion like Na plus or K plus that's associated with a weak base. And so since the Na plus and the K plus don't have any acid base properties, but the weak bases do, then what winds up happening is that salt problems wind up being weak base problems. So you work them the same way as the problems we just did other than not the not the polyprotic acid one, but that one's actually kind of out of order, isn't it? But the weak base problems. So these wind up being weak base problems. Let me just take a moment to write that in. Whoops. All right, so salt problems end up being weak base problems. And so what they'll do in salt problems, they'll give you a salt to start with. And so you have to interpret that over to some kind of an equilibrium involving a weak base. Let's go to the next slide. So salts are ionic compounds, like for example, NaCl. When you dissolve them in water, they break up into ions. However, not all salts completely break up. And I mentioned this, in, I believe in the lecture notes uh, from the previous chapter. So there are a whole bunch of salts and a certain number of them will completely break up if you put them in water, but a bunch of them won't. And remember we were talking about some of the hydroxides that form with the transition metals, like iron hydroxide. Those typically don't break up in water at all, hardly. I mean, they do, but just a little bit. So we're going to talk about this in Chapter 17b. It's called solubility. Uh, so up to this point, the salts that we've dealt with, and, and that will continue for the next little bit, are all soluble. And what that means is that when you put them in water, they completely break up like strong acids or strong bases. But just be aware that not all salts will do that. <clears throat> okay, next slide. So here, for example, let's look at three different kinds of salts and compare them. 
This one right here, and what you can do is you can kind of work backwards. So, I mean, this was originally going to have come from an acid and a base. <clears throat> so what base would you expect Na would come from? Well, I would expect it to come from NaOH. And I would expect Cl minus to come from HCl. So, uh, and that's actually the way it happens. So NaOH is a strong base and HCl is a strong acid. So this salt turns out to be a neutral salt. And I'm not going to try to write out neutral, but I'll just write in. Uh, what about KCl? Well, that's probably from KOH, which is a strong base, and HCl, which is a strong acid. So again, we're probably going to have ourselves a neutral salt here. <clears throat> and then here, the same thing. So NaOH and HNO3, strong acid, strong base, neutral salt. But they don't always have to be that way. So uh, you could have a, a, an acidic salt, which would come from a strong acid and a weak base. Next. All right, so for example, let's look at this one here. The Na is coming from NaOH. The F is coming from HF. That's not a strong acid. It's a weak acid. So we've got a strong base plus a weak ba acid, which is going to give us a basic solution or a basic salt. And those are equivalent terms. Uh, next slide. On the other hand, here we've got a Cl minus coming from HCl strong acid and this is coming from nh3 that's a weak base strong acid weak base so it's going to be an acidic salt or an acidic solution next slide so here's a chart that you can look at if you want to that kind of breaks this down uh, which i'm going to let you look at if you want to but i'll just tell you i wouldn't spend a ton of time on it because it's not the kind of thing you're likely to see on a test next slide all right, so find the KB values for these two acids. These are both uh, weak acids, as hopefully you recognize. Uh, so remember our formula, you just take 1 times 10 to the minus 14th and divide it by the Ka, and that gives you the KB for both of these. You do them both the same way. So uh, for the first one, acetic acid, you would divide 1 times 10 to the minus 14th by 1.80 minus 5, and whatever you get is the KB for acetate, which is its conjugate base. And for HCN, you divide 1 times 10 to the minus 14th by 6.2 e minus 10, and that will give you the KB for CN minus, which is the conjugate base for HCN, which is hydrocyanic acid. Next slide. Um, next. Okay, I'm going to just keep clicking for a minute here. And there are our answers. Next slide. Arrange the following from lowest to highest, giving the data on the next slide. And we're looking at this by pH. So let's just do what we can now. Some of it we can't do unless we look at the actual numbers. But if we're going from lowest to highest, that means the most acidic is going to be at the bottom. And that's going to be our only strong acid. And the least acidic at the top here is going to be our strong base. And if we've got like a neutral salt like NaCl, which we do, that's going to be like right in the middle. Okay, anything that has acidic properties is going to go between the HBr and the NaCl, uh, and that would include HF and HCN, and also, even though it doesn't look like it would be an acid, this is also an acid. It will donate a, pro a proton and become NH3Cl. <coughs> Excuse me. So that one, and so this one, this one, and this one are acids. So they're all going to fit in somewhere between HBr and NaCl. But we need to look at the Ka values to see where they go exactly. So the higher the Ka, that means they're the more acidic. <clears throat> They'll be closer to the HBr part of the range. And the less acidic means they would have a lower Ka value than they would be up towards the NaCl. And then between the NaCl, which is kind of in the middle, and the NaOH, we'll have our bases, which would be only two, ammonia and NaCn. So this one will break down to Na+, which has no acid-base properties, and Cn-. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, and we'll go ahead and break these down some more. Uh, one. <clears throat> All right, so HBr is going to be at the bottom. NaCl is going to be in the middle. Between that, we have three acids, and that's going to be this one. Well, the three at the bottom here. So the one that has the largest Ka will be next after HBr. So that would be this one. And then the next largest, which will be this one, 
is going to be next and then this one is going to be one two three four and then we're going to have this fifth and then between that and this is going to be last out of all of them that's how many are there one two three four five six seven eight and between this and the NaOH we're going to have these two and the strongest of these two right here which is going to be the NH3 will be the one next to the NaOH and then that leaves the NaCN to be between that and the NaCl next slide so here are these uh, answers next slide consider a 0.3 molar solution of NaF okay so this is a salt so we're going to see how to do a salt problem where we're just going to not worry about that Na because it doesn't have any acid base properties but F is actually F minus and that's actually a weak base because it's the conjugate base of HF so just pull that out and use that uh, so uh, what are the major species and so forth so when they ask this question right here they're assuming that everything that we're doing for salts is soluble but as I said before and I put a note to that effect down here but as I said before we're going to find out later that they're not and that there are some salts that are not soluble uh, all right so uh, what that means though is that if we put this in water this is a soluble salt so if we put it in water it completely breaks up so the reason they're telling us that is so that we'll know that if we put a 0.3 molar solution of this in water we can expect that that's going to be 0.3 molar though we don't care about it and but that also that the F minus is going to be 0.3 molar <clears throat> so that will give us our starting concentration <clears throat> and they give us the Ka value for HF which is a clue that we're going to want to wind up with HF uh, so the way that you do salt problems and uh, I don't have a lot of examples of this and <clears throat> the problems so uh, but I mean and the reason is because you do them the same way as base problems but if you want if you're concerned about that you might go because I mean there are already so many work problems for this chapter I mean it's just tons of them uh, so I'm hesitant to add any more but <clears throat> if you're concerned about that you might want to just try to find a few more on the internet or go to Mr. Max's site and see if you can find a couple of more examples and get a little bit more practice but here's how you do it you you start off here and you say okay the Na is is useless because it doesn't have any acid base properties so let's just take the F minus what is available here <clears throat> first of all to answer their question the major species are going to be water as always Na plus and F minus the, the reaction that we care about here <clears throat> I mean we have another one where we have water's auto dissociation but that's not going to be dominant it's going to be F minus and what's available for it to react with well it could react with Na plus but then it would just separate back again <clears throat> but um, and then you could also have the auto dissociation of water or you could have water reacting with Na plus which that wouldn't do anything <clears throat> the only one of these that's actually gonna work out of the various combinations that you could have would be if for example an F minus reacted with the water then you would have a KB expression you would have an equilibrium where you'd have F minus plus the water would give you HF on the right hand side of the arrow plus OH minus so that's what you're looking for and basically just to give you a hint every time you have a salt problem you're going to wind up wanting to take your anion react it with water to get a KB expression and then just <clears throat> figure out what's going to happen uh, F minus plus water well I mean it's pretty obvious that it's going to pull or pluck a proton off of the water so let's go to the next slide and take a little bit more of a detailed look at this so uh, the potential choices for major species are this let's go to the next slide um, the major species will be the Na plus as we said the F minus in the water next slide now it turns out here that for the dominant equilibrium we have the auto dissociation of water right here and we have the one that I just mentioned here and also I mentioned these other two possibilities but for this bottom one here if these two things here bump into each other and come together they're just going to break apart again and also this one right here isn't going to make a reaction because you, you're not going to have a reaction between Na plus and water so the only two legitimate possibilities here even though they like to list every possibility and the way that they do that by the way is they just take the, for example for this one we had three major species right we had H 
uh, let's see, we had not H, we had Na plus plus F minus plus water. And so what they do is they just mix and match those. And then also you always have the possibility that water can react with itself. So they just, that's how they got these four choices. Okay, but the last two really aren't legitimate. Uh, the top two are, but the K value for this number two here is tiny, tiny. It's 1 times 10 to the minus 14th. So just about anything else you, sl you slap in there is going to have a larger K value than that one. So what that tells you is that the only time this one is going to work it, or is going to actually be useful is going to be if it's the only one available. And that only happens basically when you have added an acid at an extremely low concentration to water so that you want, you have like a concentration of like 10 to the minus 11th, <clears throat> which we had an example of that earlier, right? So the bottom line is we said all of that just to say that this is what we're going to write across the top of our ice table. So notice here, this is a weak base problem, right? Which we've done these before. But we didn't start it out as a base problem. We started it out as a salt problem. So do you understand this? So uh, again, hopefully that's clear. You can email me if you didn't catch that. But le so let's go ahead and go on. What we're going to do is we're going to use that top one across the top of our ice table and then work from there. And we're going to deduce the concentration of this um, because we're going to assume that if it was original, I think it was 0.3 molar, uh, NAF, right? So we're going to assume that that concentration will also be 0.3. So let's go to the next slide if I can get this thing to go uh, next. So you can pause these and read them uh, next and next. So th what they're doing is they're just going through all this stuff. Okay, uh, so here's another salt problem. NaCN. So what? think about what is this? Well, it's CN minus, and that's covalent, right? So it won't break up into C or N. It'll just stay as CN minus, uh, and then Na plus, right? So it's a salt, right? But again, the Na doesn't have acid-base properties. So what they're going to do is say, what are the major species going to be? And we're going to wind up with Na plus, CN minus, and water. And then they're going to mix and match those, including the possibility of water reacting with itself. So we're going to wind up with another four, I think, different possible scenarios. Uh, however, only the one at will be important, just as it was in the previous problem. And that's going to be CN minus plus H2O gives HCN plus OH minus. The other ones, either they're not going to happen, basically, or if they do happen, the K is going to be so tiny, like 10 to the minus 14th. So you'll just go ahead and put that in and assume that the Na plus concentration will be 0.75 and the Cn minus concentration will also be 0.75. Uh, so uh, when you set up your ice table, you're going to start with Cn minus on the far left at the top and under it you'll write 0.75 and then for your products over on the right, you'll start with zero. So let's go ahead and set that up next, next, next. Go next. Please go there. There's the major species. Next, here are the four possibilities, <clears throat> of which the one at the top is the one we're going to end up with. Next slide. Next. Okay, so here's our ice table. 0.75. I just told you where that came from, right? Uh, these zero plus x is x for both of the products and 0 0.75 minus x. We assume x is small here, but because this is a number less than 1, we'll have to be careful, although I don't see any indication that I had a problem with the error. So let's just assume it was good to go. So here, neglect that x. So you end up with x squared over 0.75, and it also has to do with the k value. That comes into play as well. And here the k value being very small means that probably it'll be okay. Uh, so when we solve for x, we get an extremely small number, uh, 0.00346. So let me just take a quick peek at this. To get the error, we would have to divide 0.00346 by 0.75, and it looks like that's going to be well under 5%. So we should be fine there. All right, so anyway, when we do this, we set the Ka value, which was given, 0.75, 
in the problem statement equal to x squared over 0.75, we get that the x is 0.00346 as we mentioned. So we look back over here at the chart and we see that that equals the OH minus concentration. <clears throat> Remember that these numbers here are all in concentrations for an ice table. Now, when we get to chapter 17, we'll do a different kind of table called the stoichiometry table and that will just be numbers of moles. So just to let you know that ahead of time. So when we take minus the log of this number right here, we get the pOH, but we don't want that. We want the pH. <clears throat> So the pOH is 2.46, and when we subtract that from 14, we get 11.54, and that's our answer. Next slide. So, I mean, I might as well drink a cup of coffee here. While I... All right, now we're getting into this area. We're almost at two hours, uh, and we only have about 16 slides to go. So I'm going to go through this next part kind of quickly and let you read some of it on your own, because I don't want to go over two hours, I mean, for sure. And let me sit back down for a minute. So uh, what kinds of things would increase acidity in compounds? And it turns out there's actually three things. Uh, so bond polarity tends to make things more acid to some extent. So let's just talk about this quickly. And you can pause these and read these in detail if you want. Uh, but the reason that that happens is because polar bonds release the H's more readily than nonpolar bonds. Uh, so we'll see more about that in just a few moments. Bond strength affects acidity or how acidic something is in this way. The stronger the bond is between the H plus and whatever it's bonded to, the lower the bond strength is going to be. Or to put it in the reverse way, uh, if you have a really low bond strength between the H plus and whatever it's bonded to, it's easier for that other thing to let it go. So that will increase the acidity. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, and here, uh, did I skip a slide? Okay, so here are some examples. Uh, bond strengths. Notice here that the stronger the bond is, uh, all of these are strong acids except the one at the top. And the reason that HF is not considered to be a strong acid is because it's such a tiny atom and the bond strength is so strong that it tends to hold on to that H really tightly. Whereas if you look at HCl, HBr, and HI, they have lower bond strengths, so they tend to let go of that H+. And then next slide. Uh, we're going to talk about this actually more later. So this is what I just said. So fluorine makes HF. Uh, which it, that is not a strong acid, it's a weak acid, and that's because the F tends to really hold on to the H, so the bond strength is really high. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, I mean, to clarify what we said on those previous slides, and to add a little bit to it, I pulled this off the internet, so let's just go through this, and I will spend a little time on this, although we're almost out, but the strength of the bond, so let me just kind of read what this guy said. This was on an internet forum. Uh, holding the hydrogen to the molecule, if that bond is really strong, then the molecule doesn't want to let go of the hydrogen, which tends to make it a weak acid. Uh, so if the strength of that bond is low, then it will be a stronger acid, which is why we saw as we went down that chart a moment ago, the weaker the bond, the stronger the acid, basically. Next slide. But then there are other factors involved in it. So that isn't the only thing that happened. Uh, so the second factor this guy mentions is the polarity of the bond. Of the bond and we talked about that earlier also. Uh, but he says here that this can only be used minimally. So this is probably out of the three factors we're going to talk about the least important. Um, and he explains down here that when you have a very polar bond, uh, the hydrogen can be removed from the compound more easily. <clears throat> uh, and that's so, I mean, but then you also have to remember that that didn't work for HF, right? Because HF had a very polar bond and yet it's still a weak acid. So this one is kind of a minimal factor. So this would be the one that we would consider least important. And then let's go to the next slide. Stability of the conjugate base is very important, and you'll come back to this if you take organic chemistry. What this means is that let's say you have uh, let's say you have acetic acid, uh, 
If the acetic acid lets go of the H+, plus, will it be stable without it? That's what it means here to say the stability of the conjugate base. The more stable the conjugate base is, the stronger the acid is going to be. So it turns out, for example, think about in your mind HCl. What is HCl? Cl has seven electrons, and if it takes an extra electron from the H+, plus, or from the H to make the H and H+, plus, uh, then it will have an octet, which is stable. So the Cl doesn't really need that H plus there. As long as it holds on to that extra electron, it has an octet and it's happy. To, so it's happy to let go of the H plus. And that's true also for B, R, and I. Uh, when they have that extra electron that they plucked off of the H to make the H into H plus, then they have an octet, right? Because they originally had seven electrons, now they have eight. So they're stable. So uh, because if the H plus then leaves, they're still going to have an octet. What that means is that they're the conjugate base, which is what they are. In other words, the Cl minus, the Br minus, and the I, uh, I minus are conjugate bases of HCl, HBr, and HI. And they're stable because they have an octet. So I mean, really, to be honest with you, they really don't care if the H plus leaves. Uh, because they're very stable without it, because what they care about is those eight electrons. So when that happens, it means that they're very willing to give up that H+. Plus. Uh, so that means that they're strong acids. And if you think back, those are all in our list of seven strong acids, HCl, HBr, and HI. So that's what this is talking about. And this one is maybe the most important of all. Again, and if you take organic chemistry, you're going to come back to this over and over again. So the more stable the conjugate base is, the stronger the acid. Now, the exception here is HF because HF has other things going on in it, <clears throat> one of which is its tiny size uh, compared to the, like the CL, the BR, and the I. So that's why, and HF is a fairly strong acid in its own right, but it's just not strong enough that we can consider it to be a strong acid. But again, because of the other factors that are involved for HF, then we don't consider it to be a strong acid. And it isn't a strong acid by, by, by measurement. Next slide. Uh, OK, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Whenever you have an oxy acid, you have the same situation that we talked about as far as the stability of the conjugate base. The more oxygens that are attached to whatever is there, the more oxygens that you have attached to the thing that has the H on it, the stronger the acid is going to be. And let's look at some examples because I think it'll be easier to see it if we look at this chart. So this is divided up into three sections, which I'm going to draw a line here. And I'm out of time, but uh, draw a line here. <clears throat> and then what we'll do is we'll look at each of these very quickly in turn. We have one more thing to talk about and we'll be done. Um, when you add one more O here to make it from nitrous acid to nitric acid, then you make it much, much, much stronger because you've got more oxygens around this end here. And it pulls the electron density away from the H and makes it easier to let go of the H than for the one below it. For H2SO4 as opposed to H2SO3, you have an extra oxygen that pulls the electron density away from the H, makes it easier to let the H go. And then here for the Cl, you have four possibilities. Notice here on the right hand side, every time we add an oxygen, we make a huge increase in the acidity, right? And here is the one that I talked about before. This is the chloric and this is the perchloric. Every time we add an oxygen, we make the acid stronger because we're pulling the electron density over towards, whoops, I didn't mean to get that H in there. Uh, we're pulling the electron density over towards the main part of the molecule and that makes it easier to let go of the H+. So your rule on a test would be uh, the more O's that are in there, then the stronger the acid's going to be. And also, even not things uh, other than O's like Cl's, other electronegative things like Cl or <clears throat> Br or I, it works the same way. The more halogens you have on that uh, atom that's letting go of the H, uh, that also will increase the acidity. So we don't have an example of that right now, but we will when we get to the work problems. And let's go to the next. <clears throat> and then this is just explaining what I just said. Next slide. 
And then the last thing we have to talk about very quickly here is oxides, or just the last thing I'm going to talk about. And your rule is that when you have an oxide, it depends on whether it formed from something on the top right of the chart, which is a nonmetal, or something on the left side of the chart, which is a metal. If it's a metal, it will form an ionic bond. If it's a nonmetal, it will form a covalent bond with oxygen. And we, we want to remember that. Because what happens is that then, like, and what I mean by that is like for a metal, it would be something like calcium oxide, CaO. That will be in an ionic bond. Whereas if you do, uh, for example, S with O and you get SO or NO or something like that, that's going to be a covalent bond. And then when you put either of those in water, what will happen is if you put a covalent bond in water, you're going to wind up with something like HNO3 or H2SO4 where the bonds are covalent. Uh, and so the thing that's going to tend to be released is going to be the H+, because everything else is held with a covalent bond. Whereas if you put the metal oxide in water, like, for example, calcium O, CaO, calcium oxide in water will produce calcium hydroxide, which is CaOH2, where the bond is ionic. But that bond is between the Ca and the O. That's an ionic bond, which means that it will tend to break and make the OH minuses in the water come off and separate. So that will make a basic solution. So let's go ahead and you can read the bottom part here on your own. Let's go to the next slide. So acidic oxides are going to be when they're covalent. In other words, when the oxygen is reacting with something from the top right of the chart, and it's going to make a covalent bond. So these are nonmetals. So you'll want to remember that if, if you, all else fails, just memorize that nonmetals make acidic oxides. And that means that they give off H plus. The bond between the nonmetal and the oxygen is covalent. Uh, and so the H is what will come off. For nonmetals, next slide, uh, the bond between the nonmetal, like the calcium and the oxygen, is ionic. So when you put it in water and you make CaOH2, the bond will break between the calcium and the oxygen on the OH. So the whole OH will come off, and that will make it basic. Okay, that's going to wrap this up. I'm going to click on the last few slides. Here's another picture of what I just said. So you can pause there and look at that. We're just over two hours. And this is the longest one I've ever made, I think. But it's good because we get it all in one video. And then you can look at this on your own also, and we'll do this more on the work problems. An acid is a proton donor, but we can also think of it as an electron pair acceptor. And if we do that, it allows us to include more things in the acid category than the original definition. So look at that on your own. We'll come back to that in the work problems. And next slide. Uh, so we have three models. Next slide. And then that's it. So I'm going to cut it short here quickly. So I'll see you in the Chapter 16 work problem.